Um, uh, I would have to say from my own behalf, ladies and gentlemen, that you're all most welcome here. Uh, I'll introduce this meeting, I think, by just saying that a few weeks ago, a few days ago, we were up at another farm in Rathgormick on another thing, on the dairy end of things. Now, that was more or less a model farm. You were there to see what was good. Here, we're here to see the exact opposite because it's health and safety and we have to see if you're wrong. The other thing I would like to say about that particular day that we were up there, Con Lane was there and he was talking about somatic cell counts and the different ways that somatic cell count can increase. I think if a doctor was to check my somatic cell count at the moment, it would be also high. And the boy. That's why I wanted you here today. <laughs> anyway, uh, Michael Henry is an inspector from the health and safety things and he's going to talk to you on this. We have electricians here. Um, who else have been here involved in the different aspects of safety? But anyway, they're all here to get our act coordinated <laughs> together. Now, a small little statistic that I heard last night was that where agriculture is concerned, there's three times as many fatal accidents as in industry. In other words, for every one, there are three fatal accidents in industry. Now, if you take the work load into it, in actual fact, that would boil down to or boil up to a ratio of 22 to 1. So, like, it is appalling. So, unfortunately, this has to come into it. In the IFA, we would love if this thing never became legal. But, unfortunately, in order to protect ourselves and people like that, they have to. It would be my fervent wish that when the inspectors are going around to farms that people will have done things and will be doing more things. And I would love and wish if Michael's people never had to use the vigours of the law, but there's always somebody that that would have to be used on. So I'm going to hand you over to Michael and he can introduce what the whole thing is about and starting off. So Michael Henry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm uh, an inspector in the Health and Safety Authority. The Health and Safety Authority was set up uh, on the 1st of November last year to take responsibility for health and safety of all workers in Ireland, including the self-employed. And the self-employed, of course, includes farmer, farmers. Now, when we looked at the agriculture scene, we were rather concerned about the accident profile. We found that there's in or about one a week killed on, on Irish farms and uh, the number of accidents are very high and the number of serious accidents relative to minor accidents seems to be very high as well. The fact is that if a farmer has an accident <coughs> he's it's more than likely to be a serious one. And we feel there are two reasons for this. Number one, farmers work on their own a good bit. If your tractor overturns out in a field uh, or you're in the milking parlour at six o'clock in the morning. You're probably working on your own and it may be some time before you're found. And the second thing is that farmers by their very nature are usually away from urban areas, from hospital treatment, and there's some vital time lost in, in, in getting treatment. So for, for that reason, the, the ratio of serious accidents to minor accidents seems to be high. Now, as well as that, uh, and we are getting a lot of evidence from casualty units, from doctors and nurses are all saying, indeed I'm sure many of you who had reason to visit uh, any surgical wards will see the amount of amputations and so on that, that are going in to hospitals. So it's well worth while to realise that there is a problem here and we're having as part of our safety awareness week in Waterford we are trying to advise as many people as possible as to the the hazards that do exist uh, we do have powers as inspectors to go in and inspect now uh, and in fact issue prohibition notice but I don't want to dwell on that at the moment what I'm hoping to do here today is to get across to you the importance of saving Waterford farmers and indeed any other farmers <coughs> from having an accident in the first place. And we'll go around Jerry's farm here and uh, have a look. He's a typical hard worker, probably not so typical, but he's a hard working farmer anyway. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he certainly uh, has a, a, a very 
fine dairy farm here. Now we we'll look critically at some of the units he's got and uh, and comment on them. And as we go around, we'll we'll answer questions if we, if we can. So we'll take it from there, shall we? Okay. Well, well the milk and you, parlour. You, you, you lead lead the way. We'll to the take a outside. Is it, no, that was the main fuse for the for the daily farm. For the now, uh, here in, in industry, we would certainly be looking for earth leakage protection on this type of socket. Uh, the reason being that invariably it's a flexible lead which would be plugged into this. And flexible leads are likely to be damaged quite easily. So, in industry, right through the, fact, the factory situation, garages and so on, we've been looking for earth leakage protection or trip switches for some time. And I think at the moment you have that in hand, Jerry. Uh, is it? Is it? Yes. Has it been? Is it been done? We we'll go next door. We'll see. Yeah. Right. Now, as well as that, the units in question should be all waterproof. This is a waterproof, is a damp area, and consequently it's very easy to get a, an earth fault. Um, I was down in Dungarvan the other evening at, at your meeting, and uh, I was amused to a point to find that the cows, when they came into some milking parlours, became agitated and were dancing around on, on, in, in the parlours. Uh, uh, some farmers commented on this. Well, this meant that there was a significant earth fault and uh, consequently there was some electrical problem on that farm. Uh, so we just look at, at some of those units in the The way you know it is you cannot see that some of the units around here would comply with this. ETCI standard. Uh, so this is an area possibly, Jerry, that you may have to look at. Okay. No, an older house being converted. Uh, this type of installation here, as far as the wiring is concerned, we're really a bit worried about. I'm not sure if this line might not show yourself either. But it's a, a running running cables around corners like this is something that we don't recommend because somebody will come in with a bar or a, a lump of concrete or something like that and bang it. It's even the joints are fairly good. But we would like to see earth linkage protection on that type of installation. We'd like to see that in conduit, actually. In, in, in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything else I particularly want to say. It's a sort of general <laughs> kind of house. Probably not the ones that keep this better than I do. Okay. We'll go back. The cable, the, the conductors are well out of reach. And aren't subject to the same abuse as the flexible cables. However, I've just noticed now that you brought to my attention one of those. I see a bit of tape up there which doesn't look too heavy. Maybe you could look that much in a program. Changing some of the cases. Yeah. Bringing up, but they'll be all coming into here. Yeah. He'll do away with all the fuses that he comes up yeah. on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Is he here himself now? Yeah. He's around somewhere. Okay. Is he there? No, I don't think so. Oh. Oh. Getting system for his electrical unit. And uh, the morning I came here actually, uh, he had a, a fuse blown. Uh, he, he, I often feel that many farms are designed and farm yards are designed uh, a number of years ago and Can as there, a lot of farms in Ireland are inherited. The original 
designer of the farmhouse and farmyard didn't have the level of activity that's going on at the moment in mind. And consequently, when Jerry's extending his milking parlour or any of the other units are building an extension to a shed and adding electrical outlets to it, he has to keep in mind his basic uh, supply system so that he can uh, so that he can extend safely because it's very easy with the number of appliances and the number the amount of work that's going on electric wise on farm nowadays to overload so uh, Marcus Power will maybe tell us just in in, in, in detail what what exactly he's he's doing here. Now, I, I assume you all saw the fuses up on the wall inside the <coughs> milking parlour. So they'll be all changed now for MCBs, the miniature circuit breakers. The advantage of these is that unlike a fuse that blows and you have to go and replace it, they just trip out and you put them back on again. The other advantage is that you can't go and stick a great lump of wire inside in it, that the size of the MCB is fixed and you can't alter it so when it's put in for the right size the right size fuse for the right size installation you can't alter it so if someone comes along with a welder and sticks it into a socket you can't come along and put a six inch nail in and the six inch nail getting left there which causes a problem later on there's also ELCBs on this which are earth leakage circuit breakers now there's two types there's a there's a 300 milliamp and there's a 30 milliamp. The 30 milliamp is much more sensitive and goes on all sockets. Every socket that you have has to have a 30 milliamp ELCB on and the whole installation then is covered by a 300 milliamp ELCB. Now these work on, if you get a break in the cable and electricity starts leaking it causes an imbalance between the phase and the neutral and the and it will trip out and it will not go back in again if the fault persists you d it, they sometimes just trip out on their own but if there's a fault on the cable it will keep tripping out and it will have to be repaired so they, you get no leakages I've had this there's, there's cases where milking parlors have become alive in damp weather because of slight leakages and such forth and that stops that problem. Problem. The, the, that's, that's the main switch. It's bigger than most of you would have seen on yours. And this is CT metering. There's no one from the ESB to talk about it yet. But most of you will not have this in. It's, uh, it's for the size of load that's taken in this farm. The other thing is all these are waterproof. All, all of that now is waterproof. And so not everybody will have them outside of milking parlours and it's not always feasible to put them outside of milking parlours and they will have to be waterproof or hoseproof. The standards now are IP44 and IP55. Which the IP55 now will be for your milking parlours, IP55 and above for milking parlours and for dry areas like this it will be IP44 waterproof switches, sockets, etc. But it's all waterproof. And everything has to be plastic. You see the roses and lamp holders have gone. The pendant fittings, you will have waterproof plastic bulkheads. Like you can't see it now, but there's a plastic fluorescent up there. That's the waterproof fluorescent. They're, they're the type you will have in your milking parlours, not the open metal ones as we had up until now. I, ha I have not now seen that the ESB have not arrived yet. They're supposed to come with the display. Thanks very much. Here. Is it? Is it? like this here Jerry and maybe some boards that are that need need attention uh, for somebody who may go up there from time to time I imagine it's an area that's not used very often but uh, that doesn't make it any safer because when when somebody goes up there to, to do some work uh, it's, it's very easy to fall through the hole you're not, you're not seeing it every day and uh, also we would we would normally require a a handrail to be fitted, you know, right, right down to the bottom of of a, of a stairway. Uh, probably nail, nail on a, a board to the side of that there because um, a, a, a child could get a, a nasty enough tumble there. I don't know if I missed anything. Where's um, the 
Generator. Generator's over. Generator's over in the fall. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the generator, which... Now, the generator is, had to be oh, dis yeah. disconnected for the time being because of change in the... Uh, changing the system it had to be changed and we didn't have enough time to to do it back up again uh, two two things the main things is if you put a generator in you have to inform the ESB that you are putting the generator in it's not that you can't have them but they must know they're there so if they've got lines out and there's a problem on them from leakages from generators they know where to look for them <coughs> and uh, they sh proper switching for changing over. The Paddy, Paddy Rowland there <coughs> from the ESB might elaborate on that. Generators and the ESB requirements. Yeah, uh, we have noticed about say you're supposed to notify the ESB in the event of you having a standby generator. And generator has to be properly installed with the proper changeover switch. The plug-in generator, the, the, the portable plug-in generator is, is out. Uh, there's been a few accidents with the portable generators throughout the country. For that reason, they're uh, completely found on, you know. <coughs> okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. What about electric well, fences? Is there any have you any advice on electric fences? Well, as far as electric fences is concerned, the general advice is, you know, to have them wired to a proper standard, the standard that's just been talked about here, and also to have them sighted in an area which is, is safe, um, well away from... Um, ESB are taking interest these times in um, farm electric, uh, farm and uh, they general, generally they want to uh, advise people on how to improve the electrical installation on, on the farms. Uh, as you're aware, uh, I'm sure you're aware anyway, a lot of you have installations that were done in the 60s and they are not at all in tune with what's required today. We have um, a situation where there's an awful lot of only domestic uh, wiring in places where you need this type of uh, a fitting. Um, this is uh, the up-to-date uh, type of um, fitting that you would use in, in a modern dairy. It's um, hose proof and it's damp proof and dust proof. Uh, a bit more expensive than the stuff that you're accustomed to but as you can see it bears no uh, resemblance at all to what you've been uh, sort of using in the, in, in the past. Uh, domestic fittings nowadays are completely out as regards uh, wearing it. Once you go outside the door, you're into a different type of fitting altogether. Uh, the domestic one, ones are fine inside uh, in, in a dry location, but when you go outside the door, they're quite dangerous. So they haven't got the mechanical strength, they haven't got the, the, the proper electrical characteristics, and um, they're not up to the standard for outdoor work. Uh, this is the type of fuse unit you'd expect now to find in, 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 in a farm. It seems something like it inside there. That um, fuse unit, you have an ELCB. Some of you are familiar with those. They're automatic trip switches. They're um, <coughs> an ELCB there, 63 amp, that will go on your, uh, is, is a main switch, and it does a, an accident or a shock or whatever, it will go off automatically. Um, <coughs> the other one then is an MCB. That replaces the fuses. Uh, you don't screw fuses in anymore. You have uh, this business now of, uh, if you get a short, you, you, your switch flies off and you just flick it on again. Now that box there is dust proof and waterproof. You can hose it like that. Provided you have proper landing on top here, it's very important that the lands are, are properly um, fitted. Uh, used lands and some sealing compound and you get inside in the hallway maybe and uh, you would um, put it on the mains coming out. That's a, a tiny switch enclosure for a daily water heater. Uh, you put that uh, alongside the water heater and um, you have a, a, um, a proper job. A lot of people have a fuse in one place and they have a switch in another place and uh, it's not up to scratch at all. That's the type of switch you'd expect now to find out in the, in a, in the yard. Uh, there's a little locating light on it there and <coughs> it is um, what's recommended. And the cable then is MYMJ. <coughs> it's a new type of cable. 
you're probably familiar with the old grey PVC or the old black TRS. That's all out now. So it's just it's what you use is the MYMJ. That's the type of junction box it have <coughs> out in your sheds and that if you're running cables out and you're going from one place to another or dividing it up or splitting it up, uh, you'd have uh, that type of, uh, of junction box. Uh, that's the main switch there. It had that on your pump maybe or on a, <coughs> a small appliance. You could have it on a water here for that matter. And um, that's what you'd use. Yeah, that's a lockable switch actually. You could have that on a pump maybe or if you're doing something maybe with a drill or a saw or whatever and if you have children about, you'd use that type of switch maybe in a workshop. And uh, it's, you can lock that off or lock it on any way you want to. You can put a lock in it there. It's a very good switch, very safe type of switch. And it's also waterproof. That's the type of light fitting you'd have now <coughs> in, in, in a, a daily situation. That's a carbon fibre uh, 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 shield there on the front of it. And uh, that'll take two tubes. Now that's a small one. You can get them double that length or five feet or six feet, any length you want. But that's just for convenience hanging it around. It's uh, very strong and uh, watertight and has all the, um, uh, the specifications for an outside in a dairy. Uh, <coughs> you have a uh, bulkhead fitting, you're probably familiar, familiar with the old type of those, you have a glass on them and a little bit of a wire cage. <coughs> That's as a carbon fibre uh, cover, it's, it's uh, unbreakable and um, very easy to clean over the cloth and you have it nice and clean again. And it's waterproof and dustproof as well. Uh, here we then we have the, the welder plug. Most uh, farmers I've been in, and most uh, farms I've been in, they have a, a, an on a 15 amp socket on the welder, or 13 amp maybe, and they con they're continuously burning out. And you probably often ask yourself, so why is that? Why, why are they burning out and what have you? And uh, the reason is that it's too light. They're forever too light. The sockets at uh, 15 amp or 13 amp, they're only about half the <coughs> they're only about half the capacity for what you require for a welder. So uh, you get it f for a, a welder. You use a 32 amp socket, and as you can see, it's completely different to what you're used to. It's, uh, as well as that it has a shield here, when you pull the plug out, it seals, it seals up automatically here. Uh, the same thing here again with the plug for the horn or maybe around the farm yard generally. That's the type of socket you'll use. Now a feature of those sockets is that, <coughs> or the tops for that matter, uh, they can't be used inside. So there's no transfer of appliances from, from, from uh, inside in your kitchen, your, like a kettle or whatever, out to your dairy. That's out now. So you'll have to be self-contained electrically outside. Completely self-contained. There's no interchangeability at all. And as even the light bulbs there, you, you, you won't have even sort of a, a pendant light. That's what the type of fishing, if you don't have that, that's what you'll have. They're the only types of light, maybe a flood light here. It will be up very high. That's an emergency stop button there. That one there is a very useful button if you have a, if your starters, uh, <coughs> starters controlling your milking machines, they're remote from the milking machine and uh, you want to be in a position to switch them off. Uh, that type of little stop button there is very good and it's very safe, an emergency stop. Uh, this is what you'll expect now to see from the ESP in future, the gas metering, uh, when the new dairies and ones are going to be revamped. Uh, that's the type of box you'll see. Uh, your little contractor will provide that box for the ESP meters. There's one inside there. That uh, has an IP55 specification and it's completely watertight and you can spray away and do what you like with it. You're quite safe. What you want to watch out for there is, is um, there's two little symbols on the on the, on the fittings that have the, the waterproof rating, there are two little uh, triangles with, with teardrops in them. And uh, if your little contractor is about or whatever, and if you're looking at, want to know what kind of specification has given you, you watch out for the little triangles. And uh, for one, IP fifty IP forty four is is um, the minimum standard you must have, and that's one triangle. And IP fifty five that has two triangles. So it's important to watch out for that. It's a little point, but uh, it's a guide, like just to to to. Um, Letting you know what you're getting. That's the type of start you have outside. Now, you, a lot of you have the old blue, blue or whatever they are, auto remote or MEM starters, and uh, they're out now as well. And that's what you'll have. That's the type of start you have. And any, any, any type of machine you have outside now, that's the type of start you'll have. Uh, the generator is something you want to watch out for too. Uh, you have to be very careful about that. It is uh, quite a dangerous appliance if it's not installed properly. And uh, it's very important to have a proper ch changeover switch. Now, if you don't have the proper switch on them, uh, it can feed out to the ESP lines. And if it feeds out the onto the ESP lines, and if ESP staff go along to fix the fault, maybe, uh, they might come out to, to, to do some repairs on the lines that, uh, you know, after, after you've phoned in saying there's a, you have no supply and you plan your generator and you have the proper switch on it, it feeds back onto the lines and can kill ESP people. It has caused serious accidents here and there. 
So there are special uh, regulations about that. You've got to um, tell uh, ESP, first of all, that you're putting the generator in, that you have one in. And you must also notify the Department of Labour. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, the, the law of the land, as the fellow said. You have no choice there. You've got to notify the ESP and uh, the uh, Department of Labour. It's very important. They're, they're, they're very dangerous if they're not uh, installed properly. Um, just a word about dairy water heating. ESP at the moment are pr promoting dairy water heaters through the co-ops. We don't sell them ourselves, but um, the, um, we, we have organised uh, and sourced out a proper water heater for farmers, and um, one that has a proper specification. And um, <coughs> water for co-op co are doing one now. It's, it, it's the, the Dietrich. You're probably familiar with that name anyway. And it is um, available at, at uh, 25 pounds, including VAT, from all the shop uh, shops. Uh, it's a top three gallon heater. Do that. Do up to about a six cluster milking uh, machine. So um, they're quite good and uh, very efficient to run. They're, you have it for about a penny, a hot water for about a penny a gallon. Uh, it's um, about three times cheaper than gas, maybe four times cheaper than the gas, as far as I'm aware. And it complies fully with the ETC requirements. That means that it's on the power with all that stuff there, and uh, it, pro it provides uh, 77 degrees of. Um, uh, hot water at 77 degrees for a penny per gallon. <coughs> so um, you'd have you'd have it for maybe about 250 a week, hot water in your dairy. So it's um, very um, u useful and very uh, good size. Now the heaters are available in in, in, in 66 gallon and uh, and in 22 gallon as well. So um, they're available to the co-op shops. ESP don't sell them now. We don't sell them ourselves, but we have sourced them out and we've tested them and. Uh, they're okay. So the, the ones that Waffle Co-op has, and Avonmore as well, I mean from Avonmore Co-op here, uh, they have them and they're the same heater and they're quite quite good. I think that's all I have to say. Gentlemen, any questions I'll try and answer them for you if you can? If I can. Go for, go for yeah. I was just looking. Oh, sorry. Anything yeah. on power shafts as we have them here, rather coming back to them again, they would be yeah. looking at the machine below. Yes, grand. Well, we look at the machines later on, but uh, before I leave the electric lane, I was just having a look around here. And unfortunately, every year we have a number of electrocutions, both on farms and in, in, and in industry and on building sites, on, on power, on, on overhead lines. Something that you need to keep an eye on all the time. And but some of the high tipper trucks that's coming on the market nowadays, you know, they go pretty high. And um, I wouldn't be too happy with, with some, some trucks that I, I know of going under those lines. Now, I'm, I haven't been over on that ground, but it, it doesn't look to be too high there. So um, it's something that, again, you need to very close eye on. Uh, Mr. McNamara, see there. Do you want yeah, to yeah, I will, yeah. say a few words right. on this seems to be a, a fairly good one. The objection I've heard to it down in Dungarvan the other night was that it disengages the, the power takeoff if you're going around the sharp bend. But maybe some of you would be more familiar with that. Have, have, have you had experience of that with that particular guard? Anyway, I'll hand over to Mr. McNamara here. I'll borrow your stone there for a second. Uh, I'll talk first of all just for a few moments on, on the power shafts uh, and then I, if I may I'll just mention briefly what uh, uh, we'll do in Chabish over the next year or so um, on the farm safety area. Uh, there's quite a problem here. We reckon that about 40% uh, of the guards in the country are, are uncovered uh, and we've all heard uh, fairly horrific stories of people uh, getting wrapped up in them. Uh, no, that it's, it's a real problem. Uh, I think it's fair to say that you get a lot of different types of guards, uh, and uh, you have the races here, uh, and very often they're, they're damaged and broken. Uh, so I'd have to say that the, the answer in some cases may be to get rid of what you have and buy something, uh, buy something new. Uh, that might cost a bit of money, but uh, it might save a life or a limb. Um, so that, that that's the type of problem we have. Uh, basically then, let me just take up this guard. Uh, and Tommy Power has a lot of these inside, I'm sure where if you want to uh, invest. Uh, you get races, you get rings like that. 
uh, and uh, <coughs> we have to fit onto the race. Now, if the race is damaged, you're in trouble. Now, the, uh, you can get different sizes of, of these locking collars uh, to suit the different size of shaft. And I think that's the key, that you've got to match those rings uh, with the grooves. And if you don't do that, uh, then you've got to try something else. Now, this is one make. Uh, that's a Walter shield. I'll just take this one apart and just to show you how, how simple it is. There's just a little uh, screw here locking the whole thing together. And then you just turn it like that and then you just remove the, the guard. That's the water shield one. And once you get that on, um, you have the whole thing under control and you just turn it round. And then it just turns around and you just tighten the screw. So it's as simple as that. But I must again repeat, if you don't get that collar to match with the, the races, or if the races are damaged, then I think you, we all have to agree that that technique it may not work successfully and you've got to try something else. Now, the something else is uh, you can get this Cobra guard, which is an English one, which is quite expensive. Uh, and you get rings, I have a few in here spare, they're um, uh, steel rings, and you can weld these onto the uh, power shaft and then you can fit the actual cobra guard directly onto that so if you have a damaged shaft um, you, you can get around it by doing this now you can also uh, get around it using these water shield ones they have rings again they're, they've, got, they've got a lemon shaped profile and the reason they've got a lemon shaped profile is that they were made to fit hardy spicer uh, shafts uh, I see people uh, turning these so that they're ground out in a round shape that will fit any shaft and again once you weld that into place uh, then you're in control uh, and you can put the, the power shaft cover onto it so uh, that's that's basically it uh, if you can't get the collar to match I suggest that you go for the uh, welding on the steel ring uh, and then fit in the guard onto it now I work in Kidalton College and we, this is a problem we've been addressing for a number of years uh, I'd have to be honest and say that we've in difficult situations we've resorted to that and we find it expensive but we find it very good we don't want to be putting on a guard leaving it there for a month and finally breaking it off and we've used those since they became available a couple of years ago uh, with a fair bit of success uh, I must emphasize that the um, the more serious situation with power shaft guards and they're all uh, they're all dangerous but the most dangerous situation obviously is the static situation uh, where the where, where the farmer is operating close by such as a vacuum tanker Right, uh, just for a few moments, um, could I just briefly go down to a few other aspects, uh, uh, just in relation to farm safety. That, uh, and Chagas are, are very anxious to work with the farming community uh, in the whole area of health and safety, and we intend to work, and we have worked with the IFA on this, and with the Health and Safety Authority, and with the ESB, uh, and with everyone else, uh, because we, we believe it is a major problem. There's uh, a person killed... Uh, 50 people killed and there's uh, at least 4,000 serious injuries. It's about 3% three, 3 of the actual working farm population. Uh, the biggest problems are tractors and farm machinery uh, and uh, obviously we can't go through the A to a Z uh, of farm machinery here but just a few points that come to mind. Uh, a lot of accidents occur on the public road, driving on the public roads. Uh, the next thing I've done here is always disengage the PTO shaft before getting down out of the tractor. The same machine gets blocked and it's happening at this time of the year now with silage and with hay and straw from now on. Uh, if the machine gets blocked, uh, the first reflex that a man should do or the operator should do is uh, knock the PTO out of gear. Uh, we often hear of people going down, removing the blockage, the machine then starting to go again uh, with fatal co consequences. Uh, the third one then is keep the guards covered, we've already dealt with that. Uh, the next one is falls and blows. Um, this is a major problem area, people falling and tripping and things like that. Uh, the next one is children and about 30 to 40 percent of the fatalities and the serious accidents occur to children. Uh, so uh, there's two areas, one is preschool children. Uh, all we can say is that farmyards are very unsafe for those type of children and quite a number of accidents happen in that area. Uh, the second area is the teenagers driving tractors and that. Uh, all we can say on that is to uh, don't give young fellas jobs that they're not physically uh, able for or maybe not, not young enough to do. Uh, slurry is the next one I just mentioned briefly and I know these will come up again. Uh, we have the problem of gases and it's a problem now because we're putting uh, silage effluent into the tanks uh, to solve pollution problems 
that causes hydrogen sulfide to uh, release. Uh, so I only agitate and only spread when there's a good wind. Uh, and uh, keep slurry pits uh, guards covered. You know, quite a number of accidents have happened by people falling into slurry guards. Electricity, well, I, I'll just, uh, you see the type of standards that will be demanded in the future, I'll pass on that. Uh, chainsaws is another major area of concern, and we would say here to people to buy only saws uh, which have all the protective uh, guards on them. And uh, the chain brake is the obvious one, but you also have a chain catcher, a safety chain, and so on and so forth. Uh, any saw that doesn't have those type of standards, uh, it won't be, I'm sure it won't be allowed to be sold here very, very shortly, but they're quite dangerous. Also, there's protective clothing, uh, you know, uh, trousers, chainsaw trousers, gloves, uh, face covers and that, and people should get into the habit of wearing it for their own good. Uh, chemicals, farm chemicals, we would say to store them correctly and, and to wear protective clothing. And finally then on livestock, uh, we'll see I'm sure features of this as we go around, uh, about seven people are killed annually. Uh, we, with livestock, which is uh, a fairly big figure. We would say to uh, ensure that bulls are properly trained, you know, walking with them and that uh, uh, from an early age and that they're properly ringed because, uh, th because they can uh, turn on you quite easily and, and cause problems. So I suppose that's probably the reason why farming is such a, a dangerous occupation, that it's, it's wide ranging. Uh, and. Uh, we feel that uh, it's a problem that can be solved and will be solved uh, and uh, it, it must, we must also say that it's, uh, uh, it's a considerable cost in agriculture, the, the type of injuries that are happening. And we don't see, uh, the, you know, there might be money involved in spending money, but doing nothing also causes, uh, uh, costs money uh, and leads to problems down the road. Well, I, I won't say any more, but if you have any questions for that uh, later on, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Are there any are there any questions now at, at this stage? To I have a number of papers here on power shaft covering and uh, accidents and that, and our safety leaflet, yeah. um, uh, farm series number one. Uh, regrettably, I, regrettably, I would have to say that there's quite a number of captions in this, and I'm saying this for quite a number of years. Uh, but regrettably, nearly everything that happens in us seems to occur every year. So I think it's well worth. Uh, taking a, a copy of it home and having a look through it. And I think the, um, the whole family must be involved, the whole fam farm family must be involved in farm safety. I think the wives have a, we hope, have an influence over the husbands and so on. Uh, um, <laughs> okay, we're ready to go now. Okay, we're ready to go now. Tenor, you decide you'll only spend a tenor on safety. And I think the best investment to, 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 to make is to, is to buy a, a pair of overalls when you're actually working with machinery. The problem with loose jackets or loose ties is that if they get wrapped up and they'll pull you in very quickly. And certainly jer jersey material we find in industry will not give. If you get, it, it won't cut, whatever chance you have with a fabric uh, a, the, a jersey, a loose jersey, will not will not give way, and uh, a, a lot of farmers, like like a lot of other people at work, are are, are are badly injured wearing loose loose jerseys. So, if you're ready, Jerry, whatever you, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll go up to to the where we go now, the track. We'll go towards the to all of you. It's unfortunately responsible for about 50, the tractor and, and its 
various pieces of equipment that is responsible for over 50% of bottom accidents we uh, have estimated. Now, one of the major areas of danger was the it was overturning and and uh, rolling over while doing that particular job that's been done across the way on the on the silage pit was one of the very high risk areas. Here's a tractor here which is fitted with a very good safety cab. Just something to keep in mind all the time. If you have a, a tractor with an old safety cab or an older tractor, it's well worthwhile to keep keep your maintenance right. Because if corrosion sets in at the joints, it just may not work. Uh, so you need to keep an eye on the, the areas where, where, where it's likely to rust. Round here and uh, and uh, and that sort of point there which are the, the important points. Here we have our uh, PTO pretty well guarded, as good as you'll, you'll get and uh, generally speaking this this tractor seems to be safe if handled in a safe manner. Now the problem about tractors the, from what I've read on, on the accident statistics and statistics aren't that good. Uh, we, we, we really don't have a reporting system for accidents which is comprehensive. But certainly youngsters driving tractors on, on some farms uh, is, is a problem. They really go like Mandelo Park if they, if they get a, a clear coast and uh, that uh, causes uh, a lot of accidents. The other area which is concerned is farmers which are uh, uh, older farmers who are very familiar with their, with, their, with their farm and they're familiar with the tractor and the, in certain situations where they're fathered in cattle or that, they let the tractor just crawl along and uh, empty, empty off the, the trailer as, as, as they go along and jump up and jump down. Now the, 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 the old sport injury that caused a bit of arthritis in the, in the knee, the tractor doesn't know about that at all. And uh, if they're not as fit as they used to be, uh, they can be caught and a number have been caught. So that's uh, an area to, to look out for as, as well. To remember that the tractor has a mind of its own very much. Okay, I don't think I think we'll go over to to the to, to the slurry pit here to this this cattle unit. Sorry, are they coming in? I will want you to give me those now. Hi. When you're when the man. <laughs> How are you? Now you're right, lads. Yeah. Give me a show. Now, this is one of the the older cattle, the older cattle sheds, which has to be agitated right around. And uh, a number of farmers have been caught by hydrogen sulfide gas, which is coming, which uh, comes off in in very high concentrations when the slurry is being agitated. Last November, I had uh, the experience of investigating a fatal accident down in County Tipperary, where a man 30 years of age was agitating in a shed quite similar to this, except that if anything, it was a lot better ventilated. There was just two gates on the front section and the back section, there was half it open as well. And uh, he started in the morning at eight o'clock and uh, he was working on the farm. The farmer came along at 11 and found him dead. He had been overcome by hydrogen sulfide. Now, I asked to, to recreate the, the conditions. Uh, my, my own background is, is chemical, and I, I, I went in with full respiratory protective equipment and, and monitored the levels which were actually coming off at his breathing zone. Uh, he was jetting the, the slurry. He was reversing the pump. On, on the slurry tank and actually blowing air to, to, to aerate it. And the levels were, were, were astonishingly high, in or about 500 parts per million, which is, you know, at the lethal level. Now, another thing to remember in relation to this gas is hydrogen sulfide or rotten egg gas 
is very, it gives off a hell of a stink. But when you come to levels at about 50 ppm, or about one tenth of the lethal level, your nose is no use to you. You will not smell it anymore. It goes dead. The, 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 the nerve will not pick up the hydrogen sulfide. So you can't smell anything. So smelling it is no help at all. And in this situation, uh, I can only recommend that you wear an approved type respirator. Good man, thanks. Would you just hold these for a second? Uh, an approved, oops. With a, with a canister unit, thanks. Uh, which you, you actually take off the cap here and, and screw it on and, and wear a gas mask. Now, this is good for 1% for 30 minutes. So it should really get you out of a, an agitation and replace the canister after that. But really, that is the only way you can safely do it. In, because here, you've got to go right around the shed to agitate. Now, another problem I've also monitored the levels of methane and carbon dioxide which were present and they were present in, in pretty high concentrations as well. They weren't really of interest to us because uh, it wasn't that that, that that killed the man, it was the hydrogen sulphide. But in situations where farmers are going down into the slurry pit and when the slurry is, is, is put out and they sweep down afterwards this, you, you can end up with very high concentrations of carbon dioxide in this situation and, and possibly methane as well, as well as the H2S. So, again, respiratory protective equipment is necessary. But in the case of carbon dioxide, if the oxygen level, you know, carbon dioxide flows actually like water into a hole and, and stays there, it's quite heavy and you can drown in, in the carbon dioxide. Uh, you, you'd probably better leave it for a while and, and, and ventilate it before, before going down there or else maybe consider an oxygen meter or else don't go down at all. But it is an area of concern and uh, there were two farmers killed beside each other down in County Cork uh, last year and uh, this lad in Tipperary. Now it's <coughs> quite well known. Uh, it is a problem, it's made worse if you put the silage effluent into the slurry. But the silage effluent didn't go into the one in Tipperary. So if the silage effluent isn't just the, the, full, the full cause of the, of, the, of the problem. So I'd ask you to keep, keep the toxic gases from the slurry tanks in, in, in mind and, and, and invest in, a, in, a, in an improved respirator. Could I just comment there that there's, there's, we're told that there's 10,000 slat houses being built this year and there might be another five or 6,000 being built next, next year and we would be encouraging people to put the agitation points out, outside the house. Um, and the second point I'd make is that there's quite a lot of engineering in the design of the agitation system and uh, propeller systems which would tend to agitate the, the slurry more smoothly uh, would have an advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, jetting it up uh, violently all of a sudden. So I think the engineering of the house and the system uh, comes into play as well. But I think at the end of the day, there was always a risk there. So you should wait for uh, a windy day and uh, make sure there's plenty of ventilation around uh, and uh, that there are two people present uh, in the vicinity. Thanks. Are we going around the side? Get the side. Now, if you have those type of tanks, Around, the, around your slurry pit, make sure you guard them because children can very easily fall into them. Jerry's family are fairly well grown now, but certainly when, when it, when the, if visitors come on, onto a farm, they can be caught quite easily. And um, uh, very often uh, city children, when they come down visiting the grandparents, uh, are, are caught falling into tanks Indeed, tanks of water because they're fascinated by the little grubs and insects that are going around in the tanks and they, they just lean over and top over and are caught in both barrels and tanks. So it's, possible, it's, it's well to keep in mind the fact that you need a net on, on, those, uh, 
on any on any tanks. A bit of methane or a bit of excavation, depending on which way you look at it. Again, many of the accidents that happen in industry just as in farming are caused by falls. So he'd be well advised here. But we would be actually looking. We'd be asking him to put a, a fence right around the stubby tank so that we can uh, uh, so that it's safe and people won't. Top lane. What desk are we at there, Jerry? Uh, eight nine feet. Eight nine feet. Yeah. Well, in that situation where you get a cake on top and it's, it's nearly full, if somebody goes down through, it's pretty really difficult for them to get up again. And that's one of the the the, 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 the dangers attached to two solid tanks as opposed to any other liquid holder. Or to, to actually remove it, so you know it is it's quite 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 substantial. Uh, it's something that again you need to keep keep in, in mind. Now, as I'm beside uh, an asbestos uh, roof, I'll, I'll just comment on that. Would you just hold those? You you hold on that, good man. Uh, on that one, from an asbestos point of view, of course, asbestos cement does not pose any health problems. Uh, it's this, this here is 12% is asbestos, 88% cement. It's in a cement matrix, and really, you don't get any significant fibers coming off into the air. Asbestos is only, prob is only a problem when it's actually breathed into the lung, lodges there, and causes lung cancer, and so on. And uh, asbestosis and mesothelioma, there are three types of diseases related to asbestos, but they are confined to asbestos workers who, who work with the fibre all the time. Now, there is a lot of scare publicity attach, uh, being, being kicked around about asbestos cement, and we get the, in my view, nonsense that asbestos cement is being exported to uh, France for dumping. Now, it really should be dealt with at a local level here, because it doesn't pose any, any risk. What does pose a risk though is asbestos which is probably 20 years old would you say? 15. 15 yeah well when you're coming to 20 25 years old it does pose a problem if a young lad goes up looking to, to get a ball down up and uh, falls through because it's quite brittle at that stage and you can come through it quite easily and then there's a lot of people have lost their lives falling through asbestos rooms. I would suggest much more so than have lost their lives contracting asbestos related diseases. But uh, it does, this doesn't capture the imagination of the, of the, of, of the people as much. So, okay, fine, fine, fine. Want to comment on, on that? Uh, um, um, um. Uh, we would recommend to people to build only top quality walls and put in enough steel, uh, and don't you know draw your plans well in advance and stick to them. I heard of a story uh, from one of our staff only the other day where a man designed up for an eight-foot high wall, but changed. Uh, uh, to change the design at short notes and went 12 foot and you only put in the same amount of steel so the amount of steel that you put in uh, depends on the height of the wall uh, th that happened a couple of years ago but uh, last year sometime what happened was one of these big industrial loaders which, which weighed a couple of tonnes uh, and not only there was a cab on the, the, the loader uh, and um, the wall cracked right along the base and the whole thing went out uh, and the driver was uh, thrown off and he was very lucky to escape with his life and in fact he was seriously injured so I would emphasise this business of farmyard design uh, and you know, doing things right. I think the safety, uh, the issue of money always pops up as we're discussing these things. But I think it's fair to say that farmers have invested in an enormous amount of money uh, in the last 10 when the pressure comes on. Yeah, there was a, a bad summer there a few years ago when um, the government, as a, 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 a temporary measure, gave grants for, for silage slabs. And uh, 
uh, again, th this sort of situation does lead to, it's very difficult if you're rolling the, the pit uh, to, to roll the edge fairly tight. And a number of fellows were caught with tractors overturning, uh, going out too, too near the edge. And too far away, by the way, of what is? How high are you going now with that? Uh, that's very difficult. How is this going now with that, yeah? I would say that the two twin wheels in a tractor, it makes it much easier to, uh, to roll. Uh, it makes the thing much safer to operate. Uh, and uh, in wet situations, thankfully we don't have one this year, but in wet situations, obviously the tractor will float better and won't, won't sink down. Uh, and I think there are quite a number of uh, sets of jewel wheels around, like for tillage purposes, that, that could be used. Livestock handling or anything like that, if you want to pass any comment on her. You, well, I think you cover that fairly well. Yeah, well, if you have the south east, yeah. I'm a little bit lost in the other group here. Good day. Certainly, it wasn't a problem last year, and uh, consequently, the incidence of farmers' lung was quite was quite low. Now, it is a, a, a problem. Uh, a percentage of of farmers they estimate seven or eight percent of farmers do suffer on a in a in a following a bad summer from heated or, or musty hay. What we recommend is a a sort of uh, disposable type of of mask, uh, lightweight, that cost about a pound each I think. Uh, they are, are made to a BS and uh, um, 6061 I can give you the exact one and I don't have the number written on this now. But anyway, uh, I think you'd be wise if you are sensitive to uh, dust from, from us to, to, to actually wear one or maybe wear one as a preventative measure anyway. Now I see some round bales being stacked. No, there's no round bales, no. no. Well, stacking is very important anyway on, on a farm as well as everything else. We have one or two fatal accidents uh, from time to time uh, in industry caused by, by poor stacking. Now, again, you need to keep a close eye on your pallets that come in and come into the yard because a broken pallet can put a pile sideways very, very quickly. As far as round bales is concerned, the only area I think you should keep an eye on them is in the, when they're actually in the field. Uh, certainly if they begin to roll or if children are playing around them and they take off, uh, make, you know, they, 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 they could have disastrous consequences. So it's something you need to keep in, in mind when children are playing in the, in the meadow.
I think that's about all I want to say on that one. Yeah, can we come back to the, the Bulls? I think we, I think the Converter followed us up, but um, others didn't. Um, uh, I think, as I said already, I think uh, as many as seven people are killed on farms every year, and uh, you know, going around the country, you have quite a number of uh, near misses as well. Uh, just to, to repeat what I was saying, uh, the, the very minimum the bull sh should be reined, uh, and you should never trust a bull. And children are, are at particular risk, and they, they shouldn't accompany parents uh, going into fields with, with bulls. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is facilities, and, and there will be more bulls on farms now with sucklers uh, and beef cattle being more important. Uh, it's important that you, you ha we have proper facilities for housing these bulls, uh, and the, the rule of thumb is that you should be able to uh, bait and feed the bull without going into the actual pen with him. You know, obviously if you have to go into the pen with the bull, uh, you're at great risk, uh, and all you have to do is, is lunge at you to, to, uh, to cause possibly a fatal accident. Uh, the third thing that I'd say, just for a second, uh, on, on uh, cattle handling, uh, there's an enormous amount of cattle handling done in the country, and I'm glad to see Jerry has a, an excellent uh, crush over on the back, uh, and it can cut down uh, a lot on the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the wear and tear, let's say, on people hunting in cattle, uh, and uh, it can save time as well as cutting down uh, the risk. Fine, Jerry. Okay, Jerry. Well, I think that's about it. Unless you, you have uh, you have some machinery up there. Have you, you said you had a chain chainsaw. No, you didn't. Just just went over him. He was 14 years of age, and uh, he was travelling. I'm not so sure of the details of the accident, but he was probably travelling with the father behind on the back of the tractor, from what I heard. Yeah, that's a big problem actually. About five or six incidents of that every year. You know, where a child, two, three, four years up in a tractor with a parent presumably the father in most cases, and uh, uh, falls off and like a roller like that gets them. You know, I think all these things we'd have to agree are pretty avoidable and I think, you know, we should uh, you know, change our practices to um, uh, stop these sorts of things happening. Uh, John, using the three letters, C-I-T, will you just explain those before we finish up? Carefulness, ignorance and... Uh, yeah. See, I, I'm not aware of those letters, but anyway, um, I think that basically that there's two sides to farm safety, that you have the machinery side and you have the building side of it, and you have the facility side of it. Uh, and as I said already, that farmers are constantly updating and changing these. Uh, the other aspect of it is the people, uh, and undoubtedly, you know, even with the best of equipment, uh, accidents can still happen uh, if people aren't aware of the dangers. Uh, so, so that's what people often say when an accident has happened. If only I knew, uh, you know, if only I knew the danger. Well, I, I think that both Charvish and the Health and Safety Authority are going to leave no one in doubt. And, uh, you know, if they and uh, all the volunteer organisations are working on this as well. So, uh, leave nobody in any doubt uh, as to what the danger is now. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully then that we will get a vast reduction in the number of accidents that, that are happening. Again, before I finish, I'd like to thank Jerry and his wife for, for having us here and being receptive to whatever information we have to offer. Uh, we are got a lot of support from Chagas, of course, and from the other organisations, the IFA, the ICMSA, and indeed the ICA. So we're very thankful to, to, receive, uh, to you, Jerry, for receiving us on such a, indeed an open uh, manner. And um, we wish you uh, safe farming and successful farming for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think just as I was uh, saying there a moment ago, the, the three letters, I think CIT, I think just carefulness, you know, if you are careful about machinery, you probably won't have any trouble. Uh, ignorance, you know, too many people are probably handling machinery that they don't know about. And I think the third, the T stood for tolerance, you know, to understand what they're doing and patient with it and what have you. So I think if people use those, we probably would have no deaths or no serious injuries. But unfortunately, people don't do those things. So, okay, thank you very much for coming. Okay. Shetik Maintenance Systems market a range of products for the repair and maintenance of silage pits or concrete structures. Right. Yeah. And just 
we just look at this product which is a joint sealant it's ideal for the repair for our wall and floor joints or cracks prevents um, effluent penetration into the walls or floors okay um, next product here is a wall coating system it's a plasticized resin it's brushed on walls it gives concrete protection for about 10 years on walls as such the next product here is a floor prime it's a penetrant <coughs> it's a polymer resin that's brushed onto the floor and down into the floor it gives protection for about five years it prevents acid penetration into the floor as such our next product is resurfacing screed it's a resurf polymer <coughs> excuse me it replaces water it's a mix of two to one uh, one part sand and two parts sand and we we just use resurf polymer to wet it solely we don't use any water at all it's trolled down brought up to the level of the concrete it's just um, the level of concrete covered polythene for a week it's fully cured in 10 days it's anti skid seamless jointless and you can uh, join on to it next year again. <coughs> this one is for pollution control. It's a pocket pipe pollution control system. It's concreted, or uh, it's put into the concrete, leave these project one inch above the surface of the concrete, the floor, cut off the tops, and you get this effect where it's just level with the floor, it's concreted in for life. <coughs> it leads to the rapid removal of effluent from the pit, thereby reducing erosion problems, uh, putting less pressure on your walls, causing less pr um, seepage problems, and <coughs> leads to the rapid removal of effluent straight out your slurry tank, effluent tank, whatever. We recommend another row of it across the front of the pit in um, with the concrete slightly dished into the search, <coughs> and that will collect all your effluent or rainwater as case may be. You know, in Shetek maintenance systems, uh, from Cork, and we market a whole range of products for the control of um, pollution. Uh, sorry, for concrete protection and pollution control. One of the products, well, sorry, I better mention this one on the wall. Uh, so I said, never do to forget that one. Yeah. I nearly forgot it, <laughs> to be honest. <coughs> one of the products on the wall is a pit liner we use, and it's uh, very easily applied. It's ideal, sorry, okay? It's ideal for the for the very eroded pit, which is so eroded it would be expensive for the systems, or the wall is too far gone to do any repair to as such. Um, <coughs> it's just hilted nailed onto the wall. I don't know if you can see that. It's just hilted nailed onto the wall um, at about maybe 8 inch centers, overlapped with the second one. It has a lifespan of 14 years. It's guaranteed for 7 years. <coughs> it's totally acid. Um, resistant. Since and it has a smooth shiny surface, which it's um, it's it uh, helps the consolidation of grass. It, the grass will slide very easily down to the floor on it as such, so you get much better compaction of solids. Let's say on trapment.
Oh, no.